Okay. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Yes. So one of the most exciting parts about having the last session in the day is it means I can go like three, four hours. And it's going to be, who's clapping? You have really high expectations. You should leave now. It's going to be, no. Um, <clears throat> all right. So my name is Corey Sanders. Uh, I am the director of compute in the Azure team. I'm responsible for lots of different services, infrastructure as a service, uh, Windows, Linux. I'm responsible for the container service, uh, service fabric as well. So a lot of the different uh, compute technologies in the Azure team. And today I'm going to talk kind of a, a sort of a high level perspective on building apps in Azure. I do have quite a few demos that I'm going to try and walk through. They span both a Mac and a PC device. Uh, they also span all sorts of different technologies to try and give you just a little bit of a taste of all the different things you can do. So uh, you'll hopefully bear with me uh, as I walk through these things. And um, as, as I go through, if a demo does work, let's erupt into applause as I, as I go through it. <laughs> Um, just to make me feel good. And it's got to be loud since most people went to Mark's session, apparently. No, but you guys are the important ones uh, and the ones that really matter. So let me, uh, let me walk through. So I guess the, the right people are here, right? Yes. All right. So let's charge forward. So first, I explained a little bit about who I am uh, and uh, what I work on. Again, I do work on the Azure team. I focus on compute. I'm responsible for all the compute services. And from a very young age, I've been very interested in building businesses. As you can see from this adorable picture of me with my little bow tie. And so this, back then, I was already worried about building businesses and helping people build their solutions. But the key point here is that I'm also interested in doing things in a unique way. And so this is uh, the little hat that I build myself. So this is kind of a good picture of who I am, a little bit zany, and also trying to be a little bit business-like uh, as, I, as I build these things. And so hopefully some of that comes through today. All right. So. The cloud is changing expectations. This is a, a pretty big deal. Things are, things are happening with, with all the different cloud solutions. Things are happening with the way in which you can approach building technologies and building applications. From the very core of this, I do think there's sort of three big areas that really the cloud is changing expectations. <clears throat> uh, one is hyperscale. The expectation that you can grow very, very large, very, very quickly, and be able to have your application span both from a multiple machine perspective, but also from a global deployment perspective. Availability, there's really no allowance for downtime anymore. It's, it's a very interesting thing. I can remember even just three, four years ago, a bank may have downtime on the weekend. I may not be able to access it. It's amazing how angry I get if my bank is ever down for any minute. It's 3 AM. If my bank's not up, I'm pissed. And so the whole expectation around availability has changed dramatically as the cloud has made these apps much more available and a much higher uptime. Now everyone's expected to live that way. And that, uh, it's both great, but also, of course, comes with a lot of challenges as you build to that. And then, of course, agility. And this is really about that time to market. How can you get your solution out really fast? How can you take advantage of the cloud for your development and testing such that you can iterate quickly, you can develop quickly, um, and you don't have to wait for hardware to land. You don't have to wait for approvals to get your solutions up and running. You can just go and iterate. And this really is, as you look at the overall cloud perspective and some of the solutions on Azure, we do offer, uh, I believe, a very comprehensive set of solutions to enable this wide variety. So let me give you some, some sort of the details. Hyperscale. So the first step of hyperscale is really around being able to scale out your virtual machines very, very quickly. And this is a, a basic concept of what you'd expect from a hyperscale cloud, of course. But then having that scale out be very easy to manage, very simple to make changes, and also be auto-scalable without a lot of work on your end. And I'll walk a little bit through scale sets and what that means as we, as we bring that to market. Of course, on top of that, there's this concept of containers and scaling by containers. And the ability to spin up very, very quickly applications that are contained and very small, portable, uh, and being able to grow that out quickly even on a single VM. And I'll show you a little bit of the container service and what we can do with that as part of container scale out. And then, of course, global scale. And this is about how does your app actually span the world. And these are hard apps to build. But hopefully, some of the tools that we've got with the traffic manager and some of the load balancing tools that we've got in Azure, it's, it's at least easier than it would be otherwise. And so being able to scale that app across the entire world, very, very critical to be able to live up to that hyperscale potential. 
Availability. So the first thing about availability, of course, is at a local level. So being able to have localized availability about, across both physical and network. And so this is concepts like uh, uh, being able to span a rack or uh, across multiple machines, and then also being able to have your network span public IP and internal IPs across multiple machines. And this is just assumed, right? Any machine fails, you need to be able to fail over. And so we have uh, some technologies that really help here. It also, as you scale out to many, many, many instances, you want this to be automated for you. You don't want to have to go rewire things and reprogram things. And that's a really important aspect of availability. As you're scaling out, you want to make sure that that network availability, that scaling across hardware, is still going to be there even as you change and respond to customer reactions or interest in your site or your application that you've deployed. So very important to have that all automated. And then from an availability perspective, in a similar global scale perspective, having that availability that's across the entire globe, being able to span that availability from West US to East US, and being able to bounce back and forth based on demand and based on expectations for both customer proximity, but then also for downtime uh, issues in the platform or in your app. And then finally, agility. And so, <clears throat> Agility is, one big aspect of agility is, of course, developer agility. How do you iterate quickly? How do you get instances that you can spin up very, very fast, tear down very fast, re-spin up very fast, but still with all the expectations around compliance, policy controls, that you're going to want to be able to run these within your companies or within your industries? And so it's a really important combination of that agile capability with the policy and control that you expect. Really, really exciting and important aspect of this is repeatability. And I will spend uh, quite a bit of time demoing some of the two template capabilities that we have in Azure. The ability to take all the different components that are available on Azure, piece them together, make them interact with each other, and redeploy over and over and over again so that you can get that predictability in West US, East US, and even perhaps on-prem or uh, uh, other regions, other locations altogether being able to control policies, being able to uh, build your solution and then export out that template so you can reuse later. All of these are really critical for that agility. As the applications grow, the difficulty to maintain them becomes very, very hard. And this is one big aspect of making it really easy to have that agility with those big deployments. And then, of course, the last area, and I probably won't spend too much time on this, but one big area of agility is, of course, the sizing options in virtual machines. Being able to go in and select uh, the A series, the cheapest size, or maybe the D or DB2, which are a little bit faster, a little bit more SSD. The G series, which is uh, our Godzilla size, uh, which is a, a monster of a size, 448 gig of memory. Uh, don't quote me as having said Godzilla. That's actually a patented term. Uh, trademark, actually, not patented. Excuse me. Um, and then N, which is our GPU SKU. So we'll have a few of these coming out uh, later this year to enable GPU processing and also visualization of the, of the deployments you've got. So this choice, this ability to go in and pick which size you want and how you want to deploy it, a really important aspect of that agility. You don't have to worry about buying full racks or full clusters. You can come in and play with one or two and see how it goes. So very, very exciting area. So let me actually drill in and show you a few of these examples. So hyperscale. I'm going to start there because it is one of the more exciting areas, especially with some of the capabilities that we've recently released. So VM and VM scale sets. So this is uh, the change that we've really implemented over the last few months is thinking about scale with virtual machines in a very different way. So the, the virtual machines that were originally available on Azure, you'd spin them up, you'd name them Cori VM, you'd add a NIC to it, Cori NIC, you'd add a storage to it, Cori Storage, and you'd do it one by one, and, and that would be your virtual machine. And you'd, you'd love it, and you'd uh, take care of it, and that would, be, that would be the story. And then if you wanted another one, and you wanted to call it Mark VM, and then you had to add Mark VNIC, you had to add Mark Storage, you had to make sure that, that uh, the same naming convention was applied, you had to make sure you, apply, you deployed the same executables on it, you set it up the same way. It's very cumbersome. So imagine doing this now 5, 10, 15 times. Suddenly, it's a very challenging task to be able to both deploy these, make sure they're exactly the same, but then also be able to manage them so that they're exactly the same. And this has become a really, really daunting task. And so what we've released and the approach that we've taken here is a new concept to scalable VMs. It's a new object. It's not a VM. It's called a VM scale set. And what this is is the unit is all combined together. 
So it is a VM with a NIC attached to it and storage attached to it. So it is a single entity which makes scaling and consistency very, very easy. You can spin up one, you can spin up five, you can spin up 100. And it's very, very simple to be able to know that every single one of those will be identical. It will run the same scripts to start it up. It will deploy the same NAT rules as you, expl as you explode those out and bring them back in. It also enables very simple auto scale because, again, all those are identical copies, so identical that there's two VM5s, I just realized. So <laughs> that was not intentional, but it, it makes my point, I think. So uh, the whole idea, again, is that it's so simple to be able to spin these up. And we have a lot of folks who are using these, a lot of folks who are playing with these. One of the biggest users of scale sets in our platform are the higher level, the advanced services that sit on top. So our container service uses scale sets. Service Fabric uses scale sets. The HPC pack uses scale sets. So all of these things are building on this core infrastructure that allows this very, very fast, very simple scale out capability. We also have, of course, a lot of external customers using it as well. Cardigan, uh, Talk, Talk, ABB, et cetera. So a lot of these folks are building their solutions on top of this technology. So let me actually jump in and show you what this looks like. So what I've got here, I'm actually working on, let me zoom in here. I've got an application that's up and running. I'm just going to start this, and then I'm going to explain what's happening here. OK, so this application's running. I've already got a virtual machine scale set up and running. And so here's my resource group, uh, AutoCory, it's called. And I've got a scale set running. So here you can see is my scale set. OK, and so it's actually count as 1, and it's running a DV2. Uh, and so let me just close that out. So what I wanted to show you here is a few things. Uh, first of all, it's got a load balancer on it, OK? And so as I mentioned, this load balancer, it's got a set of NAT rules that are defined. So I can click the NAT rules. And so here you can see I've actually made it so that uh, 9001, which was the site that I was on, is actually going down to 9000 on the target machine, OK? And I've also set up SSH on this. 50001 goes down to 22. But you can see this, the, the NAT rule uh, and the, um, and the AutoCorey NAT pool these have a dot one on them. These were auto-generated. Right? These are not NAT rules that I created. These are defined by the scale set. And so as this grows out, they auto-generate. And so each next one will be a plus one and will be auto-generated as part of it. And so it makes it very simple, again, to know now 50,002 will be the next one, 50,003 will be the next one, and so on. And so it enables very, very simple, uh, simple deployment and rules like that. You can do your load balancing rule in the same way. It will automatically pick up that load balancing aspect as it goes. And so if you look at this actual uh, the resource group here, you can see, despite all of that power, it's a fairly small resource group. I've got the scale sets, I've got the load balancer, the IP, public IP, and a VNet. No networking NICs here. Those are all auto-generated for me. And then I have a set of storage accounts. And these storage accounts, the, the virtual machines, as they deploy, they spread across these storage accounts. So it ends up using a distributed amount of those storage accounts as it continues to deploy, again, making sure that you distribute across them. And that's all automatic as well. And so let me actually show you what this looks like from a uh, Azure Resource Explorer perspective. If you haven't used this tool, it's very fun uh, to be able to go in and take a look. And so you can see here I've got this one VM running. And so like I said, here's the VHD containers that it's going to span across. It's got the base image that's deployed. And then here's the base NIC. And so it tells me, look, I'm going to deploy this NIC. I have the pools that are deployed. And I've got the inbound pools as well. And here's the NAT that's going to be auto-generated. And so you can see that this basically defines that auto-generated NAT. So really, really easy to go create these solutions that then will be automated as they scale. And so just to show you this, this is actually a new experience. We just recently launched the capability in the portal to go create this. Amazingly simple experience to go create one of these scale sets. You go right in, configure it. and. Uh, away you go, just pick your name here. So let's just do Corey, Corey. There's a theme here. Corey scale sets, password. OK, and I'll deploy it into my account. And then I'll, let me just pick resource here, a resource group. So, and the key thing here, this says, oh, great, what is your starting image? And what is your instance count? And what's your size? And just like that, I can spin up up to 100. And away I go. And I can spin up 100. Now, the other cool thing that scale sets does it automatically over provisions. So when you're deploying, let's say, 100, you may end up falling on a piece of hardware that's broken. We'll detect it. We'll move you. We'll make sure that we're fixing it. But why wait? 
And so what we actually do with scale sets, when you deploy this way, we deploy 20% over the number you said. And as soon as we get to the number that you said, we delete the rest. And that all happens automatically. You can't turn it off, uh, but it all happens automatically as part of that deployment. So again, it gets you those instances up and running healthy as fast as possible. This is really about getting that scale that you want and that you need. So the last thing I'll show you is I have connected this through Azure Insights. And so I can go in here and click through that. And so what I've got here is I do have a rule on that's going to auto scale. And it's going to auto scale if I ever hit 50% of my CPU on average. And it's going to do that over a five minute period. And so I've kicked off the work, as you remember. And so I did kick off that instance running. Uh, and so we'll see here, uh, I did that a little bit faster than five minutes. So maybe I'll move on and we'll see. But I should be getting a call soon that's going to let me know that, hey, that instance is scaling out. Uh, and just uh, FYI, because the, 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 the load has picked up. Well, now that I've explained that, hopefully it actually happens. We'll see. OK. So what I'll do here, let me go back um, and kind of continue talking. But this is, uh, again, this is the core service under which the rest of the services are now being built to be able to handle that automatic scale, that very simple deployment, and then to be able to get this massive amount of instances running. OK. And so one example of a service that's running on top of scale sets is, in fact, the Azure Container Service. So the Azure Container Service, when you deploy this guy, <clears throat> he will deploy a set of scale sets. Uh, and so it's basically a, a set, an instance count of, let's say, five of these scale sets. Uh, excuse me, one scale set with five instances. Uh, and then we'll configure uh, the container solution that you've asked for it to configure. So we have two main offers that we enable here. One is Apache Mesos with Marathon. And one is Docker Swarm. And so the key goal here. We've created a first class service. So what this does is it spins up these machines. It grabs the latest bits from these open source solutions. These are fully open source technologies. So today it actually only runs on Linux. Um, and it is a fully open source. It pulls from the repository and deploys it. And the main reason for that is we're hearing so much demand. The expectation is, look, uh, we could have gone and written our own container service. But the idea was, gosh, there's some great ones already in the market. Uh, why don't we go enable these and make them work great on Azure? And so we enabled an endpoint uh, as part of our API. You can call into it and say, I want a container service, and I'll show you that. And then you can pick which framework you want. Now, the key thing is once you deploy that framework, your interaction with it will revert back to the interaction that you'd expect from these services. So if you deploy the Apache Mesos with Marathon solution, uh, you will end up interacting with it as if it were just a Marathon API. So you can log into it, and you can work on it. Uh, and I'll actually show you uh, Docker Swarm here in a minute. Uh, same sort of experience. It's basically that, that Docker Swarm experience that you'd expect. And the reason for that, the reason why we do that, is because we want to make sure we maintain portability. If we started papering over these solutions and making Azure APIs that sit on top of these solutions, suddenly it's no longer portable and no longer the open source solution that you wanted. It now is the Azure version of that open source solution, which is really not what we want. Uh, and so that's really the main reason why we do enable that direct experience. We've seen a lot of excitement and pickup of folks who are trying this and using it. It is still in preview, uh, but we are seeing a lot of folks play with this and deploy their solutions using the Azure Container Service directly on top of Azure across both Docker Swarm and the um, uh, Marathon with Apache Mesos. So let me actually show you what that looks like. So first, I'm going to show you the experience to create. And this is very, very new. Uh, so the experience on the portal to be able to create. And so you can create up to 100 of these nodes. So the, again, the scale set underneath, you can create 100 of these nodes that's going to be deployed on, and then a set of master nodes. So let me actually go in here and create. And so again, username. Now, I do, you do need an SSH public key. Uh, so we don't do password here. It is only Linux boxes. I have created one ahead of time so that it would be fast. And it doesn't let you cheat. It actually knows an SSH key. So, OK. And I can deploy this. Great. And so here's what I wanted to show. So here, I can pick the agent count. And just like with the scale set solution, I can go up to 100. Uh, I can go, let's say, if I want to do just 25, I can do that. Um, and it'll, of course, pick that based on the size that I selected below. And then from a master count, I can pick one, three, or five. And this is odd because it is quorum based. Right, so this is the guy that's actually the leader elector of the, of the system, uh, depending on which framework you use. So I'll pick three here, and I'm going to pick Corey ACS. 
Let's see if that's taken. Great. And so here's the point that I mentioned. So with this, I can now pick the configuration, the framework that I want to use. So if I want to use Mesos directly, I want to use OpenDCOS, which is that marathon solution that I mentioned. Um, or if I want to use the Swarm, Docker Swarm preview, I can deploy any of these, and it will automatically configure that and set that up fully for me. And so I actually already have one deployed, so I'm going to skip over here and show you this. So like, I already do have one deployed. This, the deployed. this is running a Docker Swarm instance. And so I can pull this up here and show you the instances running. So this has created a scale set. Uh, and so this is running as a, as a scale set in an availability set. And it's got a master uh, and, of course, all of the agents. And so if I go in and take a look at the master, this is the IP address. Uh, this, excuse me, this is a load balancer. I meant to click the IP address. And so I can go into this master and find the IP address. And then, of course, that's the connecting string for me to be able to uh, take advantage of this and deploy to this. Let's see here. Well, luckily, I know it ahead of time. So why don't I move forward here? OK. And so what I've done here is I actually am running. Let's zoom in here. Let's see here. OK, great. So I'm actually running on a, on a VM here to be able to connect to this. OK. And so what I've got here is um, uh, I've actually uh, already deployed uh, this container on this. And so let's see here. So I'm going to open up this SSH port. And so this is opening up. You can see what I've got here, Corey ACS build management dot westus dot cloud app dot azure dot com. This is connecting to the master endpoint for the swarm Docker swarm container service that I've created. Okay, and so it's got a set of instances running, and it can deploy whatever Docker instances I want. And so the benefit here is that it allows you to deploy and scale Docker containers very very quickly on a set of infrastructure. Okay, so I'm going to open that up so then I can connect to it. Oh, looks like uh, I already opened it. Great. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to do a, uh, a, a Docker export here. Let's see here. I think I typed it in so that I could do it fast here. There we go. So I'm actually going to export Docker host to that open port 2375 that I've created now on top of that. And so let me just do a Docker info and show you what I've got. Great. So what I've got here is this is running. Uh, a, it's actually got 499 containers. They are not deployed. Only two are running, you see here, and 497 are stopped. And so this thing is managing across a set of nodes, across two nodes, so it's a small one. Uh, but of course, you could scale that much bigger, a set of these containers. And of course, it will grow and shrink as needed. And so let me actually go in and show you what I wanted to show you with this demo. So I've got this up and running. And what I want to run here is autoscale.sh. And so what this is doing is, uh, let's see here what this should be doing. OK. Uh oh. Well, let me, uh, let me come back to that here. All right, well, what this would have done uh, <laughs> is um, uh, what you would have seen this do is uh, it actually would spin up a set of containers, and it will automatically grow those containers based on the need of the application. So as it's running, it's basically creating containers on the fly and then spinning them back down, um, and uh, very, very easy to, to be able to deploy that. Let me try one more time, see if it's uh, just, just the luck of the draw here. But I don't think it was. Nope. OK. Great. Well, let me come back here. OK. So the Azure Container Service, very exciting to be able to deploy those frameworks, those open source solutions, and be able to launch your application directly on top of them. So the last aspect of, uh, of hyperscale that's worth kind of talking a little bit about is the ability to deploy PaaS on IaaS. And this is a, a really exciting area that we've seen a ton of pickup. The ability to deploy a bunch of PaaS platforms on the IaaS instances. It's kind of similar to what I just showed you with the container service. So with PaaS on IaaS, you can now take advantage of the VMs underneath. You can take advantage of the scale sets underneath and deploy those same solutions that you perhaps would deploy otherwhere, other places. You get the same development and debugging experience, the same API, IDE experience, uh, and of course, CI, CD interface that works on all of them. And so you can deploy on Azure, but you can also now take these PaaS solutions. They're very portable. You can take them and deploy them on, let's say, on-prem. So you can get that same experience to deploy on-prem. 
uh, as well as on Azure, it makes them portable uh, and you don't get as stuck, perhaps, in a single cloud. You can even deploy them on AWS. It is a, it is a smaller cloud than Azure, so that's notable. <laughs> and then, of course, there's GCP. And with that, you can deploy on any of these clouds. And, uh, and of course, it gives you that same consistency of experience across all of them. And then, of course, there's all the others. And so some examples of this, some things that we already have support on Azure. Very exciting Cloud Foundry support on Azure. Uh, very, very cool stuff. You can deploy uh, both the open source version of Cloud Foundry, but also Pivotal. And I'll walk you through a Pivotal Cloud Foundry experience deployed on top of Azure. Um, and we do see a lot of interest there. OpenShift which is the Red Hat platform as a service, uh, that has picked up a lot of interest as well. Uh, and so you can deploy, again, Java-based solutions across both Cloud Foundry or OpenShift, and you get that PaaS experience, but very portable and very open. Kubernetes as well. We actually do support Kubernetes on top of Azure. So you can deploy Kubernetes apps on top of the Azure infrastructure. Uh, that is supported and something that we do maintain as part of the Kubernetes open source code base. A service fabric, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about today, but I do have a session tomorrow talking a lot more about service fabric. This is the microservices platform that we offer at Microsoft. Uh, and so this is, again, a PaaS solution. It also deploys directly on top of scale sets. Uh, and so this offers that microservice uh, runtime experience geared mostly towards .NET today, but expanding out from there. Um, and then, of course, JLastic and Apprenda both. JLastic, again, a Java-focused PaaS platform, and then Apprenda, uh, more of a .NET and a little bit of Java-focused platform as well. So across this whole range, you can get the benefits of that agility, that fast scale, but you can also get the mobility that comes with being able to deploy any of these PaaS solutions that you want. And so let me actually show you what this looks like on the Pivotal side. OK, and so I am excited. I, I think this just became available like an hour or two ago. So I am excited to tell you that we do have now in our marketplace the ability to deploy Pivotal Cloud Foundry uh, directly from here onto instances in Azure. Um, and so what this ends up doing is it actually deploys, uh, this template deploys a single VM. Uh, it, it ends up somewhat being sort of the staging VM. Um, and then this VM ends up spinning up the rest of the VMs that are needed to be able to run Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And for those of you who are not familiar with Pivotal Cloud Foundry or Cloud Foundry in general, uh, it's really geared towards offering a Java endpoint, a Java PaaS platform to be able to take advantage of deployments on a set of infrastructure, but be able to manage it across your entire enterprise. And so you can deploy these Java applications, many of them at a time for many different users, and be able to launch them onto a set of virtual machines uh, and be able to manage them all from this single endpoint from Pivotal. Um, and so uh, it is something we have seen a lot of excitement, especially from Java shops, who are really interested in being able to deploy this type of solution. So it deploys a set of instances. It deploys the Elastic Runtime. Uh, it also deploys uh, Spring Cloud uh, and uh, the MySQL service and Redis, and all of those get created as part of this experience. OK? And so uh, I'm actually not going to go through all the details on this, but it's very, very simple to create. Again, storage account prefix, uh, the SSH key, um, and then uh, some of the IDs that you end up getting from Pivotal to be able to deploy this. And the beauty of this is that this template allows you to avoid putting all of this secure information, this lockdown information, into config files. It actually puts it into this, into this location in the portal and will send it through to be configured live on the spot. OK, so to show you what Pivotal looks like and what Cloud Foundry looks like, I have a little bit of a demo uh, to be able to sort of walk you through. And so for those who are not familiar with the Dodge meme, or do it's actually, I looked it up how to say it, uh, and I've seen a lot of different things, but I think Dodge or Doge uh, meme, it's basically taking pictures and putting what the dog would be thinking on the screen. So in this case, it's movie star, wow, such treasure, and then wow again. OK. And so what, what, what you can do with this application that we've spun up here with Pivotal, and so uh, let me show you sort of I got a, a Pivotal deployment running here, uh, and so I'm running on top of this, and these are running on instances on Azure. Um, and so uh, what I can do here, I've actually got an application up and running, uh, and so it's actually not running, excuse me. I've got an app ready to roll, and so I'm going to show you what this manifest looks like. And so what this, what this app does, it's a very simple Java app, that what it does is it takes a picture from an Azure storage account. So I put this picture in here into CF Demo Store. 
and it adds that meme on top, that sort of that Dodge meme on top. It puts those words on it um, and uh, then presents it back out. And so as a, as a website, very simple Java app, uh, somewhat silly, but, um, but perfect in this environment. And so you can see here, um, you know, I've got the jar ready to go. Um, and so I can just do a CF push here. And what this does and what makes Pivotal Cloud Foundry and Cloud Foundry in general so great is that it makes it incredibly easy to deploy this Java application. For those who have worked in Java, it can be very challenging to be able to find, uh, you know, where's my runtime? Uh, you know, where's my framework? How do those pieces come together? Um, and how do I make them come together and work for the application environment that I've got? What Cloud Foundry does for you is it sort of takes care of all of that, especially with, uh, with uh, Spring Cloud. It puts all those pieces together for you uh, and builds the app on the fly as part of deployment and puts it onto the infrastructure that's been deployed there. So let me actually come back here and show you. So you can see here it's red right now. So this is deploying right now. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. And so it's uploading this, uh, up uploading the artifacts right now. It seems a little bit slow on the network. Um, and so uh, let's see here. And so as this ends up uploading, let's see if I can get the, uh, it's, still, it's, still, it's still uploading. So let's see here. There we go. OK, and so it looks like it just finished. And so I'll click on this and take a look. And there, I've created one. My dad sent me all my baby pictures this weekend, so they're now in my talk. So just FYI, that's why. You're probably like, OK, enough's enough. So this is me, of course, and it's been modified to show this Dodge theme, all using CF on the fly as part of this deployment running on Azure infrastructure. So that's a pretty cool one. OK, great. Let me go back here. OK. <coughs> so availability. From an availability perspective, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> going, through going through puberty again. Uh, from an availability perspective, the first, of course, concept here is availability sets and being able to span across hardware. Very, very important. And it's something that we offer uh, just built in as part of the platform. So you can come in and define what we call availability sets, and it will allow you to deploy instances across multiple racks. <laughs> and what this means from an actual practical, physical perspective, uh, first of all, it's in distinct racks, it's distinct power units, it's distinct network switches, and it's distinct servers, right? And so any of those items fail, and the instance continues to run. And so it's very important when you're deploying an application to be able to take advantage of this. Very, very, very powerful. Add on top of that the load balancer and being able to redirect traffic and spread traffic across a set of instances. These are very critical aspects of deploying highly available applications and scalable applications. And so our load balancer, the default one, it's an IP-based load balancer. You can do TCP or UDP load balancing. And it's a five-tuple or a three-tuple. Uh, and so five-tuple means it decides where to send the traffic based on five parameters the incoming IP, the incoming port, the destination IP, the destination port, and the protocol. The only one that really matters there are the two incoming, incoming port and incoming IP, because all the rest are pretty much constant. And that decides which machines to send the traffic to. This works on top of VMs or on top of scale sets. And again, on top of scale sets, it will automatically grow as the instances grow out. We also have an application gateway, which is a different service. And what this offers is HTTP-based load balancing. So now with the application gateway, you can go in, you can do layer seven or cook, cook it's meant to be cookie, cook-based affinity. Uh, uh, you can do cookie-based affinity on top. You can also do SSL offloading and even URL-based routing. And so really, really powerful stuff. You can put this gateway in and manage your deployments and your applications accordingly. Again, it gives you that local HA, it gives you that local spread of traffic. So very important, it's all IP based. Now, we also offer a traffic manager. And this is global. So this is DNS based. And what this allows you to do is a bunch of things. One, it gives that global availability. So you can spread traffic across your global regions and be able to send traffic east, west, split it up. Because it's DNS, it does try and find the local, the best place, and it also does caching just by default as part of DNS as a service. It improves that app response time, of course, because of proximity. It also allows you to do A-B testing and upgrades to be able to manage those updates across multiple regions and distribute the traffic accordingly. So the combination of these things actually add a lot of power for being able to deploy your HA solutions. So let me actually show you what I mean. All right. On to the Windows machine. Okay. 
So what I've got here, I've got two deployments that are load balanced here. So first I'm going to start with build HA East. And so here you can see I've got an availability set created, OK? And so that's already got VMs deployed in it. These are not scale sets. These are just standalone VMs here. And so I've got it deployed here. Let me actually zoom down one because I'm, OK? And so <clears throat> here you can see two VMs, East 2 and East 3, that are deployed in this availability set. So those are spanning now racks, OK? And so I can go in and take a look at what those uh, uh, load balancers are looking at. And so let me see here, East LB2. So this is actually a load balance across them. And so this load balancer then is build East US2. So let me copy that. And let me actually go to this site. <clears throat> OK, and so here, East2, great. So that's up and running. And so if I hit F5 here and uh, hit it enough, it should go East1. It's always a, this is the tricky demo, because you never quite know if it's going to work. There, oh, you, do you see it? Did everyone see it? Did it? Who didn't see it? Oh, come on. All right, let's see. Oh, here, wait, wait, wait. Let's see. OK, wait. Oh, it's not, it's not flashing anymore. Let's see here. Why is it not flashing anymore? You, you ruined it. All right, let me go in. Let me try the other. OK, you saw it. You saw it. You're lying to me. You're lying to me. The other one's even going to be harder. Hold on. Let's see here. Oh, there. It's right there. Duh. All right, we're good. All right, perfect. So it's load balanced, right? And so the reason why, by the way, it's moving is because uh, the browsers use random ports when they talk out. Uh, and so it ends up actually the port is changing, that five tuple system I just talked about. The, uh, the port incoming is changing because my browser is changing the port each time. If I actually built a web service, it would likely end up being the same thing every time because the port was staying the same. OK, and so you can see how that would then allow me to get some HA, get some uh, availability. I could scale that out across multiple instances. So I also have build HA West, and this is the single VM that's deployed there. Uh, and so what I've done here is this is a traffic manager. And so I've got a traffic manager. And so here I've got weight uh, uh, West 1000 and East 1. Uh, and so what this does, uh, it means is that it's much more likely that I'm going to go to East than I am to West. I think I got that right. We'll see. Oh, nope. Oh, now I've ruined it. That was going to be like the aha. Uh -huh. That was going to be the rip-roaring applause. All right, let me, let me change this real fast. <clears throat> So, excuse me. And so I can go in and change these weights here. And so, uh, and so here I can change the weight uh, of this one to 1 and the change. It can go anywhere from 1 to 1,000. And what that does is it basically does the, uh, uh, it selects the, the way the traffic is going to send based on the way that that weight is defi defined. So 1,000 of the connections that come to this traffic manager will go to one side and then one will go to the other uh, is, effectively the, is effectively the mechanism here. OK. So let me uh, copy in here and get this, get this again. This one's hard because this is DNS, and so it likes to, so it may, wait, what happened? Oh, OK. Let's see if I can get it to, it seems to not be liking me right now. Let's go over here. IE has maybe working for me. Hey, so you can see here, basically, it originally had the, so imagine in your head that it had happened the other way around, and then you saw that weird picture of me. So the whole idea is that I've effectively changed the traffic now in the traffic manager. So it originally was going almost exclusively to the other side. Now it's going to the east side. And actually, as part of the east deployment, it's actually going to the load balancer. So see, it just went to east too. Uh, and now that load balancer is distributing traffic on the east side. And so you can basically build this tiering system of load balancer with traffic manager, the load balancer being IP-based, traffic manager being DNS-based. OK. So the final section is really around agility and being able to do things quickly, iterate fast, and be able to deploy fast. So the first thing I wanted to show you with agility and talk about is the resource manager. This is an awesome technology in Azure. This is something we're really, really proud of because it's really cool. So one, this allows you to templatize your deployments. So you can go in and create JSON-based templates with your deployments and be able to repeat those deployments multiple times. But the key thing that's different about the way we've done it from some of the other guys is that this is a permanent collection. So this is not a fire and forget type of template. It always remains connected. So we remember and know that those resources are tied together. We remember that those are living together and they have the same health 
and life cycle, which makes them very, very easy to be able to manage and configure and actually pull back out once you've created something else. All of our policies and security principles are built using the resource manager. So role-based access control is built using this. Custom tagging for you to be able to track usage is all built and tied into the resource manager. And of course, the template story and policy. So you can go in and say, only allow people who are deploying in this resource group to be able to get uh, compute network storage. Don't give them access to web apps or something of this nature. Uh, and so it allows you to configure those policies and controls. It really is the glue that holds the whole platform together, and it connects all aspects of the deployment and resources that we offer in Azure. Of course, the exciting thing is that we've recently announced Azure Stack in preview, and this is the same template language, the same API that's supported there. So when you're doing tools, when you're doing uh, portal experience, when you're doing automation work, all of those same experiences will work on Azure Stack like they work on Azure. So really, really powerful stuff. This community is continuing to grow because of this excitement and this capability to take these templates and really move them around to anywhere that you want to go. And so let me actually show you a few cool things with templates. So first, for those who haven't played with templates yet, yet let me kind of show you quickly. I'm zoomed in here. Under resources, there's a template section. Okay, And so you can go to this. This is the Azure Quick Start Templates. It's a great place to get started to learn and play with a lot of things in the platform. And so you can go down here, and you can see all sorts of templates across all sorts of resources. Uh, in fact, look, you can even see change number of VMs in a scale set as a template. Uh, and so all of these allow you to go play and configure. So let me do my SQL. Okay. And so I've got in here lamp on, uh, let's see, that's not the one I wanted. Let's see, where am I? Let's see, maybe I do want this. Okay. Let's, let's, let me search again here. All right. Okay. I will go ahead and click on that one. Okay. And so here, I've got uh, a lamp on Ubuntu. And so you can see here, I've got a set of parameters that I can, that I can uh, configure and deploy as part of this template. Um, and I even have little, little commands. So I can copy and paste the PowerShell and get it going. I can also do the uh, CLI and get it going. But the cool thing is, I can also go into GitHub. So now I can get into GitHub. All of these are available in GitHub. And all of the partners that build solutions on Azure also build their templates and put them in GitHub. So we've now got more than 300 templates available in GitHub, more than 260 unique contributors working in this environment to build templates. And so if I scroll down here, uh, this is a MySQL deployment. I can click on Visualize. And I'll warn you, I haven't looked at this one. So it may be terrible, but that's not too bad. So now I can take a look at this. And I, oh, OK. Well, it's better now. Um, you can take a look at this template, and you can see, OK, great. So I've got a virtual machine. Uh, I've got a couple of NICs that are deployed. I've got a storage account. The NICs are all on a virtual network. Uh, and then I have a load balancer with a public IP going to one of those NICs. And so you've got this visualization here to show you what this template's going to do, how the components are going to be built, um, and uh, basically how they lay out and launch. And so you can basically play around with this. You can open existing templates, uh, quite a few things that you can do here. So let me go back, though. Let me actually hit Deploy to Azure. <coughs> and so what this does, this will actually launch into Azure, uh, directly into the portal experience, and allow me to take that template and work on it right in the portal. And so here you can see the templates available. The parameters are here. I can go and fill the parameters in and modify them right now. But I'm not going to. I'm actually going to go in and edit the parameters. And so what this does is this actually pulls up a full experience right here in the portal. See, it should pull, pull, pull up an entire experience here in the portal. There we go. Oh, oh, I was clicking on the same tab. Did anyone tell me? All right, so it pulls up an entire experience. Now look, look at this. I can go in. I can modify this template right here with this really nice user experience. And so let's say, gosh, I want to add a parameter. I want to add a, a parameter here that's, uh, oops, allow access. Add a parameter that is, uh, let's say, um, Corey at build, OK? And then, let's see, this session is pretty darn fun. OK, great. So hit Save on this. 
And so now I can go back into my parameters and you can see right away, I've got Corey at build here. The parameter's there for me. And what does it say for the tip? This session, oh, I misspelled, pretty darn fun. This session is pretty darn fun. And so you can see this experience to be able to go in and modify these templates right on the fly. Very, very powerful stuff. Uh, the other aspect here, let me go back and show you here uh, uh, from the resource groups. I want to go back in and show you. Oh, actually, it was right there. Show you from East One. So this is the load balance template that I showed you already. It's deployed across multiple VMs. I can go in here and I can hit Export Template. And so I've made iterations to this. I've added a virtual machine. I've deployed a load balancer. Uh, and maybe I, I've configured lots of different things here. This now pulls me into that same experience and shows me the living template of my deployment, allowing me now to take that and re reproduce what I've done. It's amazing power to be able to go in, modify things, edit things, and then be able to pull out that template for use later. So really, really cool stuff uh, and should make it very, very easy. Now, of course, uh, I can't leave the demo without showing something in Visual Studio, so I will show something in Visual Studio, which of course is being able to build those templates here as well. And so here, Azure Resource Manager, Azure Resource Group, you can go in and build. Look, I can even do scale sets directly through this experience. And so here in Visual Studio, automatic understanding of these templates, of these resources, and how to build them. And so I can go in, crack open the template, and you can see, again, a very, very similar experience here that you saw in the portal. But now I can go up and say add. And this will actually help me add different resources to it. So maybe I want to add a custom script to my Windows uh, VMSS. And so I've got a scale set here in my custom script. Let's call it Corey. And this is now going to run some, some PowerShell script on that box. And so let's hit add. And away it goes. And now I need to go in and, of course, type the script and go configure it. But very easy for me to go get this app launched and be able to go and uh, deploy it as much as I need. OK. And so this marketplace, this resource experience, has really helped to drive our overall marketplace experience. The huge amount of ISVs that we've got deployed, the exciting set of solutions. We just announced Splunk has now a template that can deploy multiple instances. I just showed you Pivotal. The ability to deploy these solutions, single click, multiple instances, Cloudera, Datastax, uh, SharePoint, all of these very easy to get started. And of course, all those templates you can download and learn from and then go build your own as needed. And so really cool stuff makes it very, very easy to reproduce and replicate anything that you're building in your, in your environment. And this is what we're really excited about. We do think we will continue to emphasize this template story, this experience with Resource Manager, because we think it's so powerful in the way you want to go build apps and solutions. OK. So the very last section that I wanted to touch on was dev test environments. And so when you're building out dev test environments, typically or historically, they've been very, very hard. And so building these out, okay, this is actually not a picture of me. You thought it was. I tricked you. Uh, yeah, that'd be awesome, though. Uh, you know, building them out makes me sad. They're very, very hard. They're very cumbersome. It can be a very long wait time to be able to build things, time-consuming configs to set them up. Uh, but more importantly, some of the cost control requirements, some of the policy expectations make it very, very hard to be able to set up those environments quickly, easily, where you've got that, again, that power, that agility, coupled with the policy and configuration controls that your enterprise are going to expect. Uh, and so the combination of these two is really where DevTest Labs becomes exciting and very, very powerful. And so the last section I do want to focus on is the Azure DevTest Labs. And again, this is not me. Um, uh, and so the goal with the DevTest Labs, and I'll walk you through this, this is, again, a service built on top of virtual machines. So virtual machines, the capability to go spin these up quickly and deploy them and configure them, uh, that is a very exciting part of what virtual machines offer. But the layer above that, being able to manage when they should shut down, making sure they don't stay on over the weekend, making sure you've got policy over which images are allowed or not, all of these things are a different additional service that sits on top as part of the dev test lab. So you've now got self-service agility, but with control and policy. You can test things very, very quickly. You can share things with your coworkers in an amazingly simple way. And you create these things once, and then you do use them in or everywhere. Uh, and you can, of course, integrate them with your existing tool chain. So with that, let me actually show you quickly what this looks like. Okay. 
And so here, I've got a dev, de dev test lab already spun up, and I've got a one virtual machine deployed in it. And so the first thing I kind of wanted to show you was, let's actually add a virtual machine to this. And so right now, I am the developer. I am the user of this. And so here are the controls that have been given me. So obviously, very easy. Similar sort of great experience. I can go in and deploy. I can pick the lab name that I want. So let me actually call it uh, Corey Test. Of course, the image choice that I want to go pick. And so here, these are the images that are available to me. And you can see some of these are pre-built images. So some of these are images that have been built as part of my enterprise for me to be able to launch and deploy in my environment. I'm actually going to go ahead and, and just pick the Ubuntu one. And so I'll pick the uh, password mechanism at this point. OK. And so scroll down. Now, here's, here's something really cool. So I pick my size. And so I have some choices for sizes here. Uh, and the, but the one key thing that you'll notice is that I actually don't get the choice of every size in the book. So I get the choices of A2, A3, A5, OK? And it goes up to A6. So if I go to View All, here you can see a lot of these sizes are grayed out for me. And that's, again, part of the service that's offered here. This service has been made available to me as part of my enterprise. My enterprise has decided, look, for your dev test, you don't need to be running the G5. You don't need 448 gig of memory. Uh, you know, you probably can get it done with these sizes here. And so it enables a, a lot of that control and policy to be set. And of course, it, it configures the virtual network and subnet. So this is still a part of the network that's running in my environment. Uh, I can configure the public IP address. And then artifacts. And this is really cool. So you can configure and deploy different artifacts onto the box. So right now, I've got two that are selected. And so it allows me to deploy the latest application. It allows me to deploy configuration tools. Uh, it allows me to, to, to deploy different scripts that I may want to launch onto this box. Uh, and so that configuration, that control, you can see Chef is listed in here. Uh, you can configure all these capabilities, Docker, uh, MongoDB. All of these can be added uh, and configured as part of these dev test environments that I'm building. OK. And so let me actually go back here. So I've got one already deployed. OK. And so let me actually go to this dev box. OK. And so here, there's two cool things about this worth showing. One, after you've created one of these machines and you've built it, you've installed a bunch of things that you really like, you can now replicate that creation. So I talked to you about ARM and about how you can replicate multiple resources coming together. You can also capture and replicate the actual VM creation itself. And so right here, create custom image. I can now go in. And I can replicate the actual image that I've created. So all the things that I've installed. Let's say I've installed SQL Server. It takes a long time. Now I can go in and I can uh, effectively create a custom image from that and be able to replicate that uh, multiple times into the future. And so it allows me, you saw when I had that image pull down list, those were different images that had been replicated and created in the past. The other thing here, though, is this formula concept. So you can also go in and create a formula. And so here, what this means is you're not necessarily replicating the image, but you're replicating all the steps that you took to create the image. So SQL Server is a good example. You probably want to replicate the image. It takes a long time to install. But maybe you want to, the installation of the latest chef bits. Maybe that's something that you want to actually do on the fly. You don't want to embed into your image. And that allows you to do this uh, concept with formulas. And so the formula will allow you to basically rerun those scripts every time and share that with your coworkers as well. And so both of those options are a part, a part of the dev test lab. So I've mentioned a lot about policy. And I mentioned a lot about being able to lock down the environment to make sure that you can control who's doing what and when. So uh, one aspect, of course, is um, uh, as part of this, you can decide which custom images, which marketplace images you want to make available. And so if I go in here and I basically say <clears throat> marketplace images, I can go in and I can say, you know what, I don't want all images to be available to them. I only want BizTalk 2013. I'm sure many of you, I'm sure there's many times you've all said that. <laughs> you know, if there's one thing I need, sorry, the BizTalk team is a wonderful team of people. I can't make jokes. I always get in trouble. Um, and so what I can do here is I can go in and say, look, I only want BizTalk to be exposed to my employees. I don't want any other uh, images to be available. It allows you to go in and lock down the system, again, while still maintaining that level of agility that you want with the cloud. So let me actually not do this. Let me actually come back out. 
You can do the same thing, as I mentioned, with formulas or custom images. You can lock those down, and you can decide which ones can be supported and which ones are not. Um, and so this is a good example of, of deploying Parasoft Virtualize, a test-based technology, to be able to, uh, be able to run these tests on your local box. Uh, great technology, and this is a good example of a formula that will pull those latest bits and install them on the fly. You can also check your cost thresholds. So typically you can, sad cloud. OK, well, maybe you can't today. You can also decide the policies that you want to configure for your VM. So you can decide which VM sizes you want to allow. And so you can go in, like I said, you saw that I said A2 through A6. You know, if you do want to say, hey, you know what? Some people maybe want to do the G5. All right, so let's actually save that. And you can basically go in, and now that will be a size that's in my list that's offered. You can control the amount of VMs per user, the total VMs allowed. You can even require that the machine shuts down specifically on weekends and starts back up on Monday. So all these policies, all these controls, all built in directly as part of the dev test lab. A really powerful experience, again, to get that level of agility, to get that level of control, uh, while still, of course, being able to take full advantage of the cloud power. Great. OK. So to sort of sum up what we talked about, so the three big areas that we're really seeing the cloud be both required but also enable are hyperscale, availability, and agility. And even in tomorrow's session that I'm talking about development uh, on top of uh, service fabric and development on top of different PaaS services in Azure, we talk about these same three points. Being able to scale, being able to have extremely high availability but not go down in agility. That's a very key point. Right? You can get high availability, you can get high scale, but you maybe update once a month. The agility is the key point that really ties this all together. And so with hyperscale VM scale sets uh, and, uh, and just raw VMs giving you that ability to get that scale and quickly with the over-provisioning and the automatic load balancing, container service gives you that container-based scale, being able to both deploy and manage those containers across a very large or small set of infrastructure. And then, of course, PaaS on IaaS gives that scale, that capability to deploy application-level capabilities on top of a scaling infrastructure. From an availability, availability perspective, getting that availability set story with load balancing on top and having global traffic manager get the traffic from a DNS perspective to span multiple regions and enable that type of high availability both at the local and at the global level. And then, of course, agility, getting that templatization, that ability to reproduce any solution that you've built and learn from others. We'd love all of you to go build something in GitHub and publish it back. People can learn from you, and you can learn from others. It's growing into a really nice community. Of course, the marketplace around that, being able to deploy multi-instant SQL servers, uh, SharePoint farms, all those things using that same template story. And then, of course, being able to deploy very quickly, very fast infrastructure for dev test with the policy and controls that you'd expect from any sort of small or large enterprise, DevTest Lab offers a great service that brings it all together. So across all these, we're very excited about what Azure has to offer. We're excited about what you can do with VMs. And we're not done. There's a huge amount of additional work, a huge amount of additional capabilities across all these areas that you're going to see us continue to invest in and continue to grow with these three pillars really being the focal point of enabling, enabling development on top of the Azure infrastructure. So with that, I do uh, please request that you uh, fill in a, a survey, an evaluation um, uh, on, the, on this site and let me know how I did. Uh, uh, I think um, hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, but uh, with that, I think I will call it quits. Hopefully you have a good evening. And if you want to see me more, I am giving a talk tomorrow about PaaS uh, at 6.30. So with that, thanks, guys. I have stickers up here. up here for anyone it's uh, they say my other computer is an Azure data center so limited supply but if you take a sticker you do have to give me a good score that's the rule thanks guys Thank you.